Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. I'm your host, Victoria Field, and today's guest is really great. Her name is LJ Amaral. She's been a longtime friend and really somebody who is leading the charge in the field of metabolic-based therapies. Now, LJ is an oncology dietitian at Cedar sinai Medical Center who is researching the potential of the ketogenic diet specifically for brain tumors. Today, we dive into her background, how she came across metabolic therapy, how she's implementing it into practice, um, and also some of the exciting findings she's been able to come across through her research. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hi, LJ. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to dive into our conversation all around metabolic therapy within oncology. Thanks so much. Likewise. For Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this. It's something I'm super passionate about. And, you know, I've been doing for the last seven years, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this, especially in the context of oncology, because I feel like it's just really growing and it's been growing for the last few years. Yeah. And it's been kind of a, it's been so fun to be, you know, know you since you've kind of dived into this world of ketogenic therapy and just what you've been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. Um, we're now going on two clinical trials using metabolic based therapies for cancer, and we'll definitely dive into that. But I kind of want to to start bring it back to the beginning. You're of course a dietitian, but what sort of inspired you to jump into the world of dietetics. Um, and then we'll kind of transition into how much things have changed for you over the course of time. Yeah, I, it's been a crazy journey for me. You know, I grew up, my mom was super passionate about food. She was a chef, you know, back in her early twenties and thirties. And so food was always a, a big thing in my household. And so, you know, just going through my studies, I was really interested always in science. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And then, you know, I, I took a vitamins and minerals class and thought that it was so cool that you could really enhance your health and promote or prevent a lot of diseases with your food choices. Um, and so I started to, you know, pursue nutrition. And as I was going along, kind of just got thrown into this um, combined program where I went to NYU and, and got my um, supervised practice hours to become a dietitian. And um, from there, I was working at Sloan Kettering in Manhattan. And that's where I got really interested in cancer and the cancer world. Fast forward, I come to, you know, Cedars uh, back in 2015. And it was six weeks after I had moved, you know, super green. It was like one of my first jobs. And I remember getting a referral from uh, Dr. Jethro Hu from the neuro-oncology department. And he asked me to see a patient who was young, you know, in his early forties with the stage four brain tumor called glioblastoma. And he was super fit and active and doing paleo and wanted to do something called the ketogenic diet. And I said, uh, well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, I have a lot of work to do. Uh, so I spent the next like 48 hours before the consult trying to learn as much as I could about the ketogenic diet through um, my colleagues at NYU and doing deep dives in the literature um, and decided to support this you know, young man who wanted to alter his metabolism to, you know, potentially, potentially help his, his cancer and, and help the, the growth of his cancer. And, you know, for a while, it really worked for him. And, you know, I, I'm a natural born skeptic. So, you know, I was helping him because I thought that was the right thing to do. But I wasn't sure if it was actually going to be, you know, efficacious or helpful for him. And so when I saw that it was, and, and these were things, you know, that were inexplicable outside of the change in, in diet, like, for instance, I will never forget when, you know, he let us know that he could read again, yeah. you know, and, and that was in, insane. Uh, um, like a, a <laughs> true miracle, you know, um, all just from changing the way that he ate. And then, you know, we started to recruit more patients, you and I got connected, you know, and I feel super grateful for that, because I feel like, you know, 
you just really helped me get into this and and see it for what it is and how much it can be helpful for people. And, you know, we we helped 12 people in that initial trial in that pilot study, which brought us to the phase one trial, which we just completed. You know, we had 17 patients do this four month ketogenic diet with glioblastoma. And, you know, because we had really positive results from that, we're going to move on to this phase two, you know, looking at is this actually efficacious for people who have glioblastoma and can this actually help with, you know, enhancing their standard of care with chemo radiation? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a wild ride since um, first kind of connecting through all of this and um, just seeing how much potential it has and experiencing things like, you know, patients being able to read again or seeing maybe some tumor changes in a positive way that you don't maybe traditionally see with standard of care alone, um, things along those lines that have been pretty impressive. And so you and I got connected through this amazing patient, David Shevok, who you're talking about, who actually um, is now a uh, sort of why we created the pioneer award at metabolic health summit because of really the, the bravery and courage he had to be like, Hey, why, why aren't we trying this? I've read about, I've read this. And then you, of course, were like, sure, why not? Which (laughs) sometimes isn't very common with, within yeah. the dietitian world, because we don't have as much information as we maybe need in its application with cancer. But, you know, you took a chance and it was thanks to him kind of pushing for it with Dr. Jethro who and Dr. Jethro who being so open to it. And then you and I, uh, wildly connecting through, I think some mutual contacts, uh, via quest nutrition at the time. Yep. And, um, and I was at epigenics foundation and then us linking up to be able to like work together on, you know, being able to implement this into, into the real world, or at least with patients who were interested, excited about nutrition as a tool. Um, but at the time this was years ago and there weren't really (laughs) too many, uh, tools out there for, for patient, but also the dietitian. So what has it been like for you with, um, you know, really adopting this this sort of, um, I guess therapy, because there's really no blueprint, um, within the the sort of dietetics world. If you want to explain sort of, I guess, where the ketogenic diet fit within your training and sort of how much you've had to sort of develop your own kind of protocol along the way, uh, in the process, like what that, what has that been like? Yeah. You know, so it's definitely a challenge because, you know, I, I got my master's in 2014 and, um, you know, ketogenic diets were not taught in my dietetics practice. Not that it wasn't. So it was, when I look back, it it actually was taught at NYU as a supplementary class. So you could choose to take it if you wanted to. And it was all about, you know, um, epilepsy. So keto with an epilepsy, which is, you know, fine, but I do think it was quite the challenge for, for me because, um, I didn't have any, you know, tangible information really to implement this within the context of oncology, because when I was looking at the literature, there were case studies and case reports, you know, and and the one that always sticks out to me is that 65 year old Italian woman who put herself on, you know, the water only fast and, Every other paper was saying, you know, you have to be, you know, hospitalized in order to induce ketosis. And it's really difficult to do outside of the pediatric population. And so, you know, I felt like um, it was a really hard uphill battle (laughs) trying to just learn as much as I can. Um, Truthfully, a lot of it was trial and error. You know, I've learned so much from my own practice. I put myself on a three to one ketogenic diet. So the entire protocol we did for phase one, I did on myself, including the twice daily blood sticks so that I could truly understand what it was like to be a patient in the study and what numbers influenced me and how it really is such an individualized response and approach that we have to take with every patient, you know, knowing that they're also going through cancer directed treatment and sometimes fat is difficult to get down you know, if they're having any side effects from their treatment. And and so it's really a, a very nuanced therapy that you have to just learn as much as you can, I think, either through your own practice with your within yourself and then also within, you know, the patients. But I'm I'm hoping to to change that, you know, um 
some dietitians and I are, are trying to team up and um, educate more dietitians, you know, throughout the country on ketogenic metabolic therapies and how it can be beneficial for certain disease states. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, creating this manuscript to share with um, people who are interested in implementing it within the oncology setting so that there's, you know, a step-by-step kind of manual um, in terms of how to best approach, you know, implementing the diet within patients who are undergoing treatment as well as, you know, for survivorship. Yeah, that's great, which is it's such a needed resource in the world, um, for sure. And it, it's such a, a new idea around being able to, I mean, cancer metabolism is something that's, of course, that area of research is exploding, is really exciting to see how um, big a, a part of the conversation nutrition is in the mix of everything and, and how much potential it can have therapeutically. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it must have been kind of scary to dive into using ketogenic therapies for cancer when there isn't really a blueprint necessarily. Um, what was that like, I guess, in, in trying to help patients stick to the program, you know, motivate, I, I feel like it's this huge piece of empowerment. Um, and that in and of itself can really offer so much to somebody who's in such a scary time already and kind of feeling a little bit helpless in their situation, kind of give some of their power back. Do you want to speak to that sort of initial process of transitioning these patients that we worked with initially, like in the sort of first, uh, first trial or pilot study, if you will. Um, and what that was like to, to help these patients onto that protocol when, you know, it was a very new thing, uh, for you and just in, in the world in general. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's, Super, there's so many layers to it, right? Because um, especially for, you know, certain generations, it's really difficult to have people, you know, ad lib, eat and enjoy fats. You know, it's a lot of fat phobia because of the 70s, of course, you know, and so um, you have to really take this humanistic approach, right? Because there's so many things that are happening when you have a cancer diagnosis, right? So your whole world got flipped upside down within a moment in your life, right? And then on top of that, we're coming in and asking you to change the one thing that, you know, also brings a lot of comfort and people show their endearment through food. So there's a lot of emotionality that's attached to food. And so, you know, we're asking them to make this huge lifestyle change. And then, you know, of course, then they're going through cancer treatment, which, you know, then you're having to deal with a lot of side effects. I like to call it the whack-a-mole experience because there's, you know, sometimes always something that's popping up that you have to deal with. And so, you know, you have to really take all of these things into consideration and meet the patient where they're at, you know, and then from there, exactly like you're saying, really encourage them. So I take a lot of time to educate my patients so that they understand what they're doing for themselves. And so when they make their choices, they are conscious of the fact that they are choosing to, you know, help themselves in a very, very, very um, healthy and um, in my opinion, powerful way, you know? And so I think a lot of it too really comes down to encouraging these patients and reminding them and getting really clear with them on what their why is, you know, so a lot of them, because it's a stage four brain tumor, and they don't have a lot of treatment options, most of them are pretty motivated, right. But then of course, we're humans, and there's temptation and there's social aspects of food and the whole thing. And so, you know, you have to always have them come back to their, their why, what, why is it important for them to be doing this? And that's always something that, you know, helps to continue the process. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it's almost like there's a big mindset piece to all of this. And, um, you know, I think making it fun in the process and sustainable for people, um, is a key piece. You know, I think a lot of, uh, folks in the research space talk about how difficult it is for compliance. I mean, what you were kind of talking about initially of like, you know, this is only something in pediatrics and very last resort and kind of what you learn. Right. But then, as you sort of try to meet the patient where they're at, they're at, like you've done such a great job with, you understand that you can kind of open this up to making it, making it something that they can be a, a part of, despite the fact that 
potentially in the last 24, 48 hours, their life has been completely flipped upside down. I mean, uh, many of these patients like glioblastoma patients, they'll go and have a seizure. Everything's normal, have a seizure yep. and go in for a brain scan. And that's how they find it. And this can happen within a matter of days and your life right. is completely changed. And, you know, that's um, really scary. So to, to, for you to come in and be like, okay, Hey, there's something we can do together. We can make it fun and exciting and learn, you know, more about your body in the process. That's, that's huge. And such a, an amazing piece that I think you've been able to develop over the years too, to, to really help people stick with it and make it, you know, something that can, I, I think cause sustainability with this um, therapeutic approach is something that's so key that, you know, yeah. you can get somebody to transition maybe onto a, like a four to one or three to one or whatever the case may be. But if you're not really meeting that person where they are and kind of helping them with making substitutions and exactly tailoring this to the individual, really, it, it yes. becomes very difficult. <laughs> called otherwise. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I think one of the biggest things is exactly what you're saying is we take this approach of, well, what can I have? Let's right. focus on that. And then, right. you know, I, what I, exactly <laughs> something I think is massively important though, is that for patients to, when they have that initial console, when they decide to do this therapy, what's their number one thing that they're going to miss? You know, it, it's always one of the, the few, you know, it's like right. rice, potatoes, or um, like a pasta, right? Like something like that. And so, you know, it's my job to then find recipes that can match that. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's, what's important in terms of sustainability is finding things that promote that normalcy, you know, because cancer isn't normal. Right. And like, that just sucks. And I'm sorry. And so let's do something though, that can still bring you comfort and control. Totally. You know, yeah. in the process. Absolutely. Bring out the spaghetti squash and all the fun substitutes. <laughs> yes. which Give me the best. noodles. But, yes. <laughs> Give me the miracle noodles. Yeah. Cauliflower rice. We like you. Yeah. Right. Yes. All the cauliflower things. No, for sure. It's, um, it's such a hard process, but it, it can be something that can be made to be fun with, with the pay. I mean, as fun as it can be when you're dealing with something so terrible like that. Um, exactly. But there are ways to go about it for sure. And, and, um, so talk a little bit about, you know, the sort of the results of that, that pilot study, the clinical trial you guys have initially, um, published and what you're trying to get out of this next, uh, clinical trial or what you've, you have gotten out of this next clinical trial, share some of the, the really great, you kind of briefly touched on it, um, but share some of the really great results that you've found and, and where there are some holes that we've got to learn and maybe do a little bit more work. Sure. So from the pilot study, we had a lot of, you know, it was a small pilot study. So of course, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, small changes that we've observed in, in the patient population that we picked essentially. And so, you know, a lot of these patients had improvement in their symptoms or especially within, you know, of course their seizures. Um, what we thought was interesting was things like fatigue and um, strength improved or was stable throughout their treatment, which we don't typically see, you know, and then just, you know, picking out some people who are off the top of my head, you know, like, so for instance, Dave, you know, he had a tumor where it uh, affected his ability to read. After he started keto, he was able to read again. You know, we saw these kinds of things with other, you know, physiological changes and improvements. So I will never forget one of my favorite patients. Uh, he was 28 years old with a glioblastoma and he had um, left hemiparesis. He had a foot drag and, you know, he was pretty fatigued. Um, he would always come to clinic kind of dressed in sweats. And um, after he started the, the diet, he not only, you know, was able to start running again, he was able to start painting his figurines again, which, you know, includes a lot of fine motor skills. He was able to fly to two of his um, family members' weddings by himself and give speeches, you know, and his family calls that his miracle summer. Um, because he didn't have, you know, a better quality of life than when he was on keto. Um, and then, you know, so that prompted us to do this phase one to assess safety and efficacy within the population who are getting, you know, the six weeks of um, oral chemotherapy, temozolomide, and then the six weeks of radiation. And again, you know, we saw people who had um, either stable or improvements in their cognition and their um, 
their fatigue, which again, we typically see, you know, a decrease in that as patients are going along. And then, you know, in general, we just saw people getting through treatment better. You know, they had less side effects, they were having more energy levels, um, and they were really able to tolerate the diet. You know, we had a lot of great compliance, which I know is not like the norm. Um, but, you know, we do really see that, you know, psychosocial support is important. You know, you can do the diet, of course, but it's hard going through cancer treatment and then also trying to, you know, get all of your meals and, and things together because it's a little bit more nuanced and difficult to, you know, just do the diet when it's a little bit, you know, more restrictive. And so having that help can be really important for people. And then of course, having, you know, a lot of check-ins and, and motivation and having people understand, understand that, that they, they will be held accountable, you know, for um, their, you know, dietary choices because we're checking in. And so, you know, I'm looking at their glucose and ketone logs, I'm looking at their food diaries. And so, you know, when you have that, I think people are even more motivated to stick with it. So we had a lot of um, success with that. And so now we're going to do a multi-center study where we're looking at a larger group of patients. Um, and we're going to actually look at if this has any effect on the tumor size and tumor burden um, for patients. Which is great. Um, it's so exciting. Some of those initial results that you guys got out of the pilot study are just, I mean, you know, regaining the ability to read and, uh, you know, improving fatigue and all of the, those are big deals when it comes to um, go also simultaneously going through cancer therapies at the same time. Um, for maybe a dietitian who's listening, who understands the potential application of ketogenic therapies in epilepsy, because that's something that's been used for over a hundred years as a, a possible line of defense, usually, unfortunately, uh, after um, pharmaceutical interventions have failed. Uh, but speak to brain cancer specifically, and a dietitian who might be listening and not understanding how they're could be um, similar benefits in some ways. Cause of course, when you're dealing with something like a brain tumor, you may also be suffering from seizures and, seizures. and what have you, um, but right. speak to the similarities there and the potential mechanisms between the two for somebody who's maybe not familiar with how that even could make an impact with somebody who has brain cancer. Sure. And I think, you know, what I'm noticing, which is really exciting is that a lot more dietitians who are doing keto for epilepsy are also now seeing you know, adult glioblastoma patients. So mm -hmm. I'm, I am really excited about this. And I do think that there's a lot of um, potential and, and that there's, there's going to be a lot of crossover, but, you know, so what we see of course, is that patients do have a lot better seizure control. So we have patients who will have seizures of course, because of where their tumor is located, but it does help to change their neurochemistry to make it less favorable for them to be having a seizure in the first place. And especially for people who have like a lower grade glioma uh, or an astrocytoma, you know, who have longer lifespans, frankly, you know, they also have a lot of seizure disorders. And so they really benefit from going on, you know, a, a low carb ketogenic diet, maybe not a three to one, but definitely at least a one to one or a two to one. So not only are they getting the seizure benefit, but also, you know, we're, we're not talking about meats, butter and cheese, right? Like that's like my one shtick is like, keto is not all just meat, butter and cheese, like sure, they can be components of it. But that's not what we're focusing on. You know, so we can actually benefit them in terms of lowering and decreasing the amount of inflammation that they're having or cerebral edema. You know, of course, if we're trying to manipulate their metabolism, where they're producing more ketone bodies and less glucose, then we're manipulating the amount of nutrients that are going to the tumor cell, which then changes the vasculature or the amount of blood vessels that are going to that, that changes the amount of oxygen that is going to the tumor. You know, there's a lot of different benefits. They're looking at BHB or beta hydroxybutyrate, a type of ketone body acting as an antioxidant. So then, you know, scavenging the, the free radicals and protecting our normal cells, which, you know, of course is very beneficial after a cancer directed treatment because there's a plethora of free radicals. So, you know, I think there's also yeah. a lot to be discovered um, in terms of the benefits, you know, just looking at even thinking of like short chain fatty acids and how that can be beneficial for one's health. And that's going to be abundant, you know, from eating a lot of um, butyrate and um, healthy fats throughout the ketogenic diet. Um, so, 
you know, in terms of cancer and brain cancer, I think there are a lot of health benefits. I do think that there's a lot of room for um, more research, of course, in terms of uh, more benefits. Um, Dr. Sheck has an amazing um, infographic on how keto is really helpful for cancer. And then also I love um, Dr. Barbara Koffler's study on keto and cancer, where do we stand? Because that also provides a lot of um, evidence in terms of um, the types of literature that is available in, uh, for keto and um, different types of cancers, if anybody is looking for resources. Absolutely. And you um, just were diving into different sort of um, types of ketogenic diets for epilepsy and, and brain tumors. You're referencing one to one, two to one, three to one, four to one. You know, you and I are very familiar with the, those terms. Um, can you explain that for those listening? What sure. does that mean? And also what does a protocol, you know, of course we're, we're not giving medical advice on this podcast, um, but uh, what does it look like in terms of transitioning somebody onto a, a ketogenic diet specifically for cancer? If you want to kind of explain that. Sure. So to the first part, um, the one to one, two to one, three to one, those are all talking about the ratios of fat to the ratio of um, the grams of carbohydrates and protein combined. So something like a three to one ketogenic diet, which we consider to be a classic ketogenic diet is something like 82% of your total calories coming from fat. <laughs> right. um, and so, you know, the point being though, is that with the four to one to one to one, there's the MCT oil diet, there's the low glycemic index uh, treatment diet. There are multiple ways for people to get in and to sustain ketosis. And so for the, the higher ratios, I'm not sure if that is necessary for cancer, whereas it is a necessity for, you know, inborn errors in metabolism and epilepsy. So I'm not sure if, you know, a cancer patient would benefit from something of like a four to one ratio. Um, so, you know, that being said, I, I don't think that there's like a, a one size fits all in terms of a ratio for cancer patients. It really depends. Um, I found that, you know, <laughs> of course, people's metabolisms are extremely individualized. And so, you know, you can have somebody, you, you know, two people eating the exact same food on the exact same plan and have radically different ketone and glucose numbers. So, you know, I, I kind of try to go based off of what's going on with them currently, where they're at with their treatment plan, where they're at with their weight and their goals. And then also, you know, are they, are they able to easily produce ketones or not? Because that would really influence the amount of fat that I would recommend that they would eat. Right. And you're also looking at like, of course, blood values of ketones and glucose and seeing, cause you know, you've got people who maybe can reach uh, certain levels of ketones and lowering a blood glucose, eating a two to one ratio versus exactly. else, like you're saying, you know, has to kind of really dive into three to one and higher to get certain numbers. And two, there's like sort of benefits to understanding, you know, lowering blood glucose or insulin and the benefits of that. And separate to that, the benefits of ketones in and of themselves and what the research is exactly. showing about potential anti-tumor properties with, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate and what have you. So it's right. really interesting. There's so many unknowns and that's why it's so important. The work that you're doing at Cedar sinai to be able to have these clinical trials and, and, you know, one to understand the safety and, you know, potential efficacy of that, but to be able to implement this into the, the real world, we have to have that kind of research. So, uh, which is what you're doing, which is so exciting. And, and also taking that dietitian approach of like, how to make this sustainable at the same time. And I mean, in your opinion, and working with uh, however many cancer patients you've worked with now uh, with this metabolic therapy, how how feasible is it uh, when you're dealing with something like a life-threatening diagnosis and trying to completely change your lifestyle at the same time? You know, is it as hard as maybe some researchers think it is? And what would you say to those folks who are uh, apprehensive about trying it because they are worried it's such a difficult diet, especially dealing with something like cancer? Yeah. And you know, it is valid. I mean, I'll tell you, it is difficult. Yes. Right? <laughs> For sure. It's not a walk it is. Part. I'm yeah. not going to lie to you. Sure. But you know, it also can be easy. Mm -hmm. It can be feasible, you know? So I think that it's, it's really important for, for cancer patients in particular to not do this alone, honestly, just because it, it really is, it's super nuanced. There's so much that goes into it. There's a lot of planning. So 
the first thing I'll say is I, I don't recommend doing this like without any um, supervision or without, you know, any guidance. Um, but, you know, I do think that it, it can be easy to go into. You don't have to, I don't recommend a night and day approach, you know, so if you get diagnosed, I don't think that you need to overnight, you know, change everything. Um, you absolutely can if you plan it correctly. Um, but I don't recommend pro, it. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because, right. you know, it increases your, your risk for the keto flu, which doesn't feel good. I did it myself and it feels terrible. And then that, you know, throws people off because, they're like, well, hey, I'm supposed to get a benefit and now I feel worse. Right. So, you know, I try to avoid that at all costs. Yeah. So Electronics I try to be a great tool, right? For that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So like if you if you wanted to, you know, restrict your carbs and, you know, really focus on electrolytes, um, I, I would re recommend though doing it in a stepwise fashion. So if you wanted to do like lightning speed, I would say just one day at a time, reduce the amount of carb that you're eating. So, you know, like if people are eating super heavy, high carb diets, it's going to take you about a week, you know, because I, I don't want it to be like, so if you're having, you know, a carb at breakfast, lunch, dinner, you're having soda, you're having sugar, you're having, you know, chips and stuff in, in between, that's a super high carb diet, it's very processed. And so, you know, I don't like to rip the rug right underneath them, especially because that's kind of what just happened with them with their diagnosis, you know, so it's like, ah, it's a little too harsh. <laughs> one step at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's not do that. Um, so, you know, just one serving at a time, if they can, I think that's super helpful. You know, if you want to incorporate MCT oil in the beginning, I think that can be really helpful especially the electrolytes, keeping up with hydration, that is imperative. Um, and then for certain people, of course, you know, if they want to do any um, exogenous ketones or, you know, a little bit of diluted apple cider vinegar, that can also be helpful for, you know, increasing the initial ketone production. Yeah, those are all great um, words of advice. And especially to the piece to don't do this alone, definitely do it alongside your, your uh, medical professional, um, or if you, you know, are a dietitian really do your homework on ways to make it a little bit more easy and sustainable. And, and also thinking about like other pieces that kind of intertwine into the thought and efficacy or potential of metabolic based therapies when it comes to just lifestyle as a whole, as I know you're very much into is, you know, what is, what are your sleep patterns look like? What, you know, talk, speak to that, like in terms of what are some other key lifestyle areas that you might focus on with, um, you know, of course, within um, your role as a dietitian, but speaking to some of those things that can actually influence, you know, hunger hormones and all of these things that kind of come into play, but maybe people don't necessarily think of that can have a huge role in the actual efficacy of the metabolic therapy itself. For sure. So, you know, not only would it affect your hunger hormones, but, you know, these things also affect your glucose, right. you know, so if you're dehydrated, that it affects a, your, you know, lack of sleep, of course, um, is, is very de detrimental, uh, which I, I laugh because, you know, it's like one of those things where you feel so terrible, like the next one is stress. And so right. it's like, yeah, let's tell cancer patients not to stress and like, please right. sleep more. Of course, of course, they want to do that. You know, yeah. it's like, it's so much easier said than done. Um, okay. So I, I always just say that disclaimer, because I am very empathetic. Um, so stress, uh, sleep, dehydration, exercise, you know, these all influence um, either positively or, or negatively. Um, I do think that exercise is super important for cancer patients. Um, you know, it's depending on what their doctor allows. But you know, I've seen people go through, you know, the, the six weeks of chemo radiation, I had one guy training for a marathon during it. Yeah. He was running like 15 miles in the first week and like, just, Oh my God. Yeah. And he did totally fine. Like, wow. That's... Throughout, I mean, like he, he eased up a little bit on the mileage towards week six, but like people, yeah, people are surprised, but you know, I always, I, I don't think that, you know, we paint chemo radiation in a great way. I mean, of course, people do have side effects. Don't get me wrong. But when you can plan well with this metabolic therapy and you can pair it with things that synergize it like exercise, you know, you can really have amazing benefits. Like these people had pretty good quality of life throughout their treatment, which is, you know, something to say. Oh, absolutely. That is impressive. First of all, the the marathon runner, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't even know that. Yeah, that's that's really <laughs> impressive. 
uh, and not typical, I'm sure. But um, speaking to that, just in terms of, you know, I think one of the biggest barriers or fears around implementing this kind of therapy or just a low carb diet in general with cancer patients. And it's a very, um, you know, uh, I can understand the issue and, and fear around it is, you know, because cancer cachexia is a very real thing and just weight loss in general mm-hmm. with a cancer patient who might be undergoing chemo or radiation or what have you just due to loss of appetite and everything else. H- right. How do you approach that piece of it? Because I'm sure, you know, there are dietitians listening where they're like, well, what about weight loss and sure. the threat of that in and of itself? Yeah. And again, that's valid, you know, because people do lose weight on this diet. Right. And so that's just one of the things though, that it's in imperative that you monitor on a weekly basis. You know, they're coming in every day for radiation. Like you can make sure that they get weighed once a week. And then, you know, of course, like I'm very cognizant of percent body weight lost, you know, so if they're losing 10% of their body weight in a week, that's like a huge red flag, of course, for any clinician. And so, you know, does that mean we have to stop the diet? I don't know. It really depends on the patient and the degree and the severity of it and, you know, where they're at now. If they're super malnourished and cachectic, maybe, you know, maybe I would add a, a few complex carbs to help promote you know, their weight maintenance, depending on what's going on. But really, I can just most of the time increase their calories, and they stop and sometimes even increase, you know, their weight. Also, though, a lot of times this weight loss is coming from muscle loss. So, you know, unfortunately, that's one of the realities is that a lot of people are very active, and then they have a senior, they have a craniotomy, and they're inactive. And so, you know, muscle is really easy to lose. It's also the most weight that we have. So, you know, it is important to be mindful of what type of weight is being lost. um, And then, you know, monitoring that, making sure you're checking in with the patient, um, making sure that their labs are within normal limits. They're still, you know, nourishing themselves, but there is a a degree of weight loss that is to be expected. Um, And so it's just about managing the risk and how, how far it goes. I, I, I've rarely had patients so come off the diet because they've lost too much weight in, in a short amount of time. I can count on one hand and I've been doing it for seven years. Yeah, that's great. That's very encouraging um, because I know that is like, of course, a very, as you mentioned, valid um, uh, potential issue. But of course, when you're being so individualized with each patient, you can hopefully mitigate some of that risk. Um, going into it and being mindful and weighing and and keeping a close eye on things and body composition, as you'd mentioned, I think that's a key piece, yeah. right? Yeah, um, because there are studies that actually show that ketogenic diets are, you know, muscle sparing and that they can be actually kind of protective against cancer cachexia. You know, I think that there's, you know, obviously more research that's needed to support that, but I think it's also a very interesting area of research that's going to be growing. Yeah, it's certainly encouraging where the research is headed. And that brings me to my my last question for you, which is, what do you hope for the future of metabolic therapies within oncology? And what hurdles do we have to overcome to get there? I, this is a small well, question. <laughs> I know, I'm like, well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I think we well, another, need another hour for that one, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Especially I'm like still chewing on it. Um, <laughs> you know, what makes me really hopeful is that we're at this spot. I mean, I, I cannot believe, you know, seven years ago, you could not walk into a grocery store and find anything that was keto. I mean, mind you, half of it is a scam. <laughs> and so I will <laughs> say that, you know, they love marketing and, and that's great for them. But um, I do think that it's really amazing that there's this huge uh, interest that's just blossomed over the last year. And it's, you know, infiltrated our way into the mainstream market so that, you know, this is more feasible for people. Um, I, I think that though, there's just maybe one link that's missing. I'm not sure what it is and I'm, I'm desperate to find it. And, and that's another piece of hope is like, I, I'm desperately finding that one piece that can accelerate this and and really make a significant difference in people's lives because we see we see change we see you know positivity we see improvements with patients but i want to see like massive change you know what i mean like um and that's really my hope and and also i think one of the biggest hurdles is trying to figure out what is that crux what are we missing? What is, what is it that we need to be doing for each and every patient that is going to be effective, you know? Um, and is it, do we have to add 
exogenous ketones? Are we adding probiotics? Are we, you know, like there are so many unknowns that I think that we need to be asking, uh, which is exciting and hopeful, um, but also big hurdles for us in terms of clinicians, in terms of, you know, how are we actually going to be implementing this within our patient population? Yeah. And everybody's, as you mentioned, is so individual in terms of their own unique metabolism. And there's so many factors at play and even types of cancer that, you know, may or may not respond to this kind of therapy. There are a lot of unanswered questions, but I certainly feel like, you know, the work you're doing and the education, um, you know, piece to all of that and sharing that work is so key in, in allowing for other dietitians to know this is feasible. And at least maybe let's have a conversation around food or what the patient is eating, just as like a baseline, maybe even not necessarily transitioning them onto a low carb or ketogenic diet, because there are a lot of unknowns, but at least having that conversation around food that sometimes I think is maybe overlooked upon an initial diagnosis like that, that you guys are doing such a great job to tackle head on, especially when a patient is motivated to want to do it. So um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done for sure yes. uh, on in multiple areas, but you guys are really doing such quality and great work at, at Cedars and you yourself, I know have been like championing this through, <laughs> um, you know, kind of fighting you. for it along the way. And, and we totally noticed that you, as well as Dr. Jethro, who have just been such amazing voices within the field for this. And I know that the future is bright, um, thanks to you guys. So uh, thank you for spending some time thank today you. to talk about this. Uh, where can everybody find more information about you, um, the work that you're doing, and some of the uh, research that's coming down the pipeline? Yeah. So um, I am at ljamaral.com, and you can find a lot of my different links from there, um, publications, uh, my social media, those kinds of things. But uh, I'm I'm thrilled to have had this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, I think Dr. Who and I um, were really grateful for, you know, our past meeting so many years ago and the ability to help all of these people, you know, it really, uh, we couldn't have done it without you and, and everyone at MHS. And we're just super grateful for everything that you guys do. And, you know, to have this conversation is really amazing. And um, thank you. Oh, thank you. The feeling is is totally mutual and we're excited to continue to follow your work and um, support each other along the way in this crazy field that that um, we're trying to push through, right? So <laughs> yes. we got to do it together. So exactly. Thank you so much, LJ. Um, I'll, we'll definitely direct people your way and uh, we'll certainly be following up on your work soon, but I'll see awesome. you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Metabolic Link. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share it, subscribe, follow, and leave us a comment or review on whichever platform you use to tune in. We hope you'll join us next time.